Hello and welcome to yet another instalment of our Nucleus Wealth Insight series. Just a quick reminder that the following presentation is general information only and does not take into account your personal circumstances. Whilst Nucleus Wealth aims to present informing and sometimes entertaining content, please consult your investment professional, financial advisor, or better yet, speak to us before making any decisions based on any of the themes discussed in today's presentation. And don't forget that this is a live presentation, so feel free to drop any questions you like in the chat box below and we can answer them along the way. If you're watching this after the event, make sure you attend the next one so you too can participate in the live Q&A section of our presentation. Our presenters today include myself, Tim Fuller, a certified financial advisor who has worked with hundreds of clients over the years, helping to make the complex simple for companies such as AMP, Mercer and independent advisories. Sitting across from me, we have Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen, whose 25 years in the world of finance has seen him as the founding partner and head of research at analyst firm Aegis Equities, head of quantitative strategy at Wilson HTM, and was responsible for mining energy and big data in the $60 billion global quantitative equity fund at Troders, which are a multinational, multinational asset management company. And of course, for more information, please check out our people section at www.nucleuswealth.com. So hello and welcome to yet another installment of Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, and we've got a, a little bit of a different uh, pathway today that to our uh, traditional uh, investment themed ones. And now we thought perhaps today we'd focus on uh, financial advice. And uh, we had a recent uh, case come over over the desk um, that we thought, you know, I guess as a public service announcement, we might like to highlight and, and, and do a little bit of work on um, to sort of uh, illustrate uh, what, what sort of floats around out there uh, for the uninitiated. So I'm joined today with our head of investments, Damien Klassen. G'day, Damien. Hey, Tim. So I, I probably should have said hello and welcome because um, I'm going to be sitting mainly on the other side of the table for this one, uh, doing the doing the questioning. So, you know, it's sort of one of those things where a uh, relative of mine popped in with a, a few a few thoughts, uh, you know, so an investment um, they're particularly proud of and sort of then uh, we just sort of took it apart a little bit and, and I thought it would be well worth sort of, sort of sh showing the steps that sort of Tim went through to uh, to sort of follow up on, on, on the advice and, and things that, you know, you can do yourself. Um, you know, you don't actually need to go to somebody for this. You can just sort of go through and, and, and do a lot of this yourself when you after you've had advice and then if you need a second opinion, then you can uh, sort of take it from there. Fantastic. All right. No worries. Absolutely. So we'll jump into the agenda. So we'll have a quick look at um, what is bad advice or what can be bad advice. Uh, then we'll jump into um, this uh, very real and, and recent scenario uh, that, that came across the desk. Have a look into uh, whether or not it was bad advice and uh, we'll run some, some calculations and some outcomes there as well. Uh, some potential red flags that uh, I found um, in, in investigating sort of what was sort of going on behind the scenes and um, I guess after the questions were raised, we tried to find some answers. Uh, then looking into um, a second opinion um, and also uh, what can be done. So with no further ado, we'll jump into it. Um, so what is bad advice? So look, I guess the main thing is it can take on many forms and, and it's not always uh, obvious uh, to, to many people. Like like anything in life, when, you, uh, when you're looking for uh, help in a certain area, you go and see someone who touts themselves to be a professional in that area and you, um, you, you might uh, you know, obviously relate your personal finance, uh, financial details and your personal goals and dreams and aspirations to, to somebody, which um, is a, you know, can be quite a, a challenging and daunting task in itself. Um, and then, of course, you, you then uh, expect to have a, a good quality service. You typically pay for this service. Um, and and in, the, uh, in the reports or the outcomes or the recommendations that are made, um, I guess uh, on, 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 on any basis, you assume them to be uh, fair and correct and to, and to help you get along your way. Your thoughts, Damien? Yeah, but uh, I think the, the key thing for me is, is recognising that um, I think most people, when they walk into their doctor, and they say, look, here's what my problem is. Uh, they expect to get a, a relatively unbiased answer about, you know, here's what the here's what you should do about it. Uh, whereas I think when you walk into a used car salesman, you, um, you, you, you're you on alert, you know that he's gonna sell you whatever he's got on the shelf and that he's there to, to make a commission off you and he's not there to say, oh, look, mate, I haven't really got the right car for you. Why don't you get down the street? 
he's going to tell you, mate, this is, you know, regardless of what he's got, he's going to, he's going to pitch you the best thing he's got. And so, and I think the, the, the issue I see is that most people go into financial planners thinking that they're in to see a doctor and um, some financial planners are very good in the same way some used car salesmen people are very good, but um, the most financial planners are certainly in the past and, and um, you know, less so now, but they've been re- rewarded like used car salesmen. And so it's it's not surprising that uh, if you reward somebody on the basis of a, you know the more product you sell the more you get paid that they'll they'll flog product and they they'll they'll flog you the, the product that gets you the that gets them the highest commission. Well, that's it, and I, and I guess the other on the flip side is as well that if um if you you know you're given a set of recommendations, then um, the hardest part then is you've gone through a long process. Sometimes it can take a number of weeks, maybe a month for the for the advice to be put together, or you know back and forth and all the rest of it. And then of course. Um, Naturally, I think like in anything, you know, say even if you're going to buy a car, mm. you don't typically take the first one that comes off the shelf. Don't you? you might go down the road and check out another one. Mm. What makes it very difficult with financial advice is you've now potentially, in order to do your due diligence, got to go and establish another relationship potentially with somebody else mm. and have the whole process done again. And who has time for that you know, these days? So. Yeah. And that's a, using a doctor analogy is very similar again. It's the same yep. thing that you know, most people, if, if it's something particularly severe, they might go get a second opinion, but for... Um, you know, 80, 90, mm. 95% of the time, you're going to go, well, the doctor said, this is what I do. Take some antibiotics or do whatever. And I'll just take their opinion. I'm not going to go around and getting three opinions for, 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 for minor things. Yep. Sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, so I'll take it. But of course, as we'll illustrate in a, in a little while's time, um, taking the wrong advice can be quite expensive uh, in the long run as well. The final thing I just wanted to touch on as well, and we'll cover off on this in more detail towards the end, is is a, um, a, a, a thing called best interest, which is um, actually legislation. <laughs> um, and we'll cover off on exactly what that means. But it is something um, that I just want you to think about um, you know, in terms of advice providing uh, an outcome that's in your best interest. Um, and that's um, a very uh, strong theme through today's uh, presentation. Um, so we'll jump into the recent scenario. So it was a, a family member, I won't say um, of whose family, but um, apparently, uh, well, they were explained, it was explained at a barbecue that they have uh, recently bought a property uh, using their super. And I guess in a way, they were happy about this because they like property and they weren't able to buy a property. So superannuation gave them that opportunity. Um, the location was in out of Brisbane. Um, it was a, a unit or an apartment. Um, it was using an, an SMSF, a self-managed super fund structure with gearing in it. Uh, and there was also some life insurance um, thrown in to yeah. the recommendation. Yeah. And so to put it in context as well, the, per- the person came in with um, just a, with, with money sitting already in a, um, an industry super fund or a, um, or a retail super fund um, between, the, between the two. Uh, people and they were looking to then so this was actually a, a, a new super annuation self-managed super for annuation fund being set up yep sure and and, and i guess um you know like anything we, when you're not in the industry um and you, you get something like this who, who really knows you know it's it seems to be ticking quite a few of the boxes you're getting a you know you wanted to you feel like you need to have a property this gives you an avenue to buy a property you couldn't otherwise um and i guess from the on the flip side for someone who's been in the industry i i you know had a quick look at it and you know on the basis that you know they had 150k in super, they're borrowing you know, 174. So LVR was 50 odd percent, or a bit you know touch under, which um, you know for most property investments is you know almost a green light. Um, you know on the basis that you know you're not wound completely up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some there, there is some potential there. Um, you know some some so quite a lot of equity sitting in the structure. But more importantly, I think. Um, what became apparent was the fact that the, 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 the person or the people, the couple that were uh, recommended this, were relying on their financial planner, a mortgage broker and an accountant really to provide a lot and, of the... And a property salesperson. And a, and well. a property salesperson to, mm. to, to provide a lot of the recommendations that were, were sort of being, you know, were intrinsic into, into this advice, mm. um, which is, is a red flag, I guess, but at the same time, it's probably very commonly found out there. Mm. So. I think particularly in terms of the... the you know, if, you, if you've got a property, uh, somebody selling property who can, who, you know, I can't do this for you myself, but but I'll give you a list of a few people who can do it for you and, and pass you on to to, to people who, who they know, mm. you know, will tick the box. And the, the daisy chain continues. So mm. so that, that's our scenario. So what we thought we'd do then is, is run the numbers. So we'll, we'll start with the actual um, the case in point. So we've run some assumptions here. We won't spend too long on them, but I, I guess a couple of things. One is that um, we... 
we, 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 we tried to estimate a lot of the areas that weren't you know, explicitly set out um, or available to us as best we could. So um, you know, we, we, the loan was, uh, we estimated, we used a figure of 6% with an interest-free period of five years. Um, might be very difficult to get in the current climate, but yeah. at the same time, I think um, you know, that's leaning on the side of um, you know, probably being a bit optimistic. But anyway, yep. um, got a cash reserve in the, in the self-managed super fund, um, estimated a gross property yield of uh, 5 percent um as a, as a gross running re- yield which is, which is the average for units in in brisbane and a lot of this information we just found off websites and core logic and etc anyway yep. um a super guarantee of 7k uh so, so what this thing there is you're putting it you're putting an extra seven thousand per annum into it because i think that for for the people investing this was a large part of saying oh look i can, I can afford the repayments mm. and that was the, like that was sort of the the whole part was can i afford the repayments i can great i can go and do this and and which um you know as an investor's point of view is saying well just being able to afford the repayments um doesn't mean it's a good deal <laughs> that's yeah. right so absolutely and and so um and and then really just the rest of them we got some um from just getting averages from from online really averaging but conveyancing um we ran the stamp duty queensland rates um body corporates rates etc so um we did work in inflation so we, we worked on a basis of um three percent in, increasing in costs but also increasing the contributions by by three percent so. and the uh and the rent and the rent as well. yep perfect. so so i think as well we've one of the key assumptions we've got right at the top is that two percent increase in property per value per year now that's that's obviously the, the the big one so you know from a gross perspective what you're looking at for this is saying um you're going to get two percent in capital plus you're going to get your five percent back in 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 yield um we think that's that's pretty aggressive for the current scenario mm. um it's you know if if you can run it with high numbers and and if you if you want to put in um you know, property increases at 10 percent per annum for the next 15 years then this is going to be a fantastic deal so, mm. if, so if property prices go up by um by big amounts per annum then you know take on as much gearing as you possibly can and and, and happy days which is largely what we've seen over the last sort of 10 15 years in, in australia yep the, the the issue is um you know there's already a lot of complaints about property prices and how high they are there's already lots of building going on um to us, that says it's it's not sustainable. Mm. The actual um, the last ten years in Brisbane have given you an average of, well, it depends on who you want to listen to. I guess um, was it Michael Yardney thought one point five percent, and Core Logic thought negative three percent. Yeah, well, and that, well, that was the whole thing. Trying to find um, you know workable and, and you know I guess you know. Yeah, workable long-term, um, you know, values that um, weren't negative was quite difficult, and of yeah. course that's not going to help the situation. So we thought, well, if um, if Michael Yardney can can estimate or has, has given us a historic um, 1.5, let's call it two, mm. and um, and build in a bit of upside just to um, to keep it fair, I guess. Yeah, so. and so yeah, and where we'll get to with this is you know without without destroying too much of the the excitement of seeing what the final outcome is, is that um, you know even with sort of you know two percent. Growth plus five percent yield, so sort of seven percent total return on this, uh, before fees and everything. Um, things don't things don't look very good. Mm. Um, you need to have re- quite aggressive assumptions to to, to get things looking a lot better. But Absolutely, anyway. and, and and that's and that's one of the key drivers I think with all this is that it's whilst you've got say a, you know an investment that with a seven percent potential yield, mm. you've got so many costs and and you know ongoings that yeah. that that pull back that to yeah. Um, yeah. make it. And so that's that's the, the the key part for me is any property investment. You need to remember this with any property investment, regardless whether it's in a super fund or not in a super fund. Is as soon as you buy it, um, you're out by your stamp duties and your um, uh, conveyancing costs and your legal costs and all. There's a whole bunch of sort of these setup fees. So that um, if I put in, so say in this case, uh, you know, I put one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in for a three hundred thousand dollar property. Um, well, that we, we calculate there's about fifteen thousand in, in setup costs. Mm. So I'm putting in one hundred and fifty. Um, straight away, I've got 135 mm. left. So you're, you're starting behind the eight ball from from day one, which um, is uh, you know, a lot of people sort of gloss over that because mm. they, they look at the returns on on the actual property. They look at the 300,000 and and what that does in terms of the property. But but you do have to remember from day one, regardless of whether it's an unlisted property trust or a, or a listed entity or whatever, there are these costs where um, you know a dollar in. You start with ninety cents or, or less in terms of now you got to make up the the, the rest. And I, and, and one one other thing I guess too with um, just people who um, are you know quite property centric and we speak for a lot of Australians here is that um, you know property's been a good investment for quite a long time whether it is in the future is a you know a topic of another uh, webinar and certainly plenty we've done in the past. 
Importantly, though, um, there's a couple of key differences, though, when you think investment property in SMSF. Mm -hmm. So so one is the fact that SMSF um, internal loans are typically quite you know, significantly more expensive than a normal you know, home loan. Yes. You know? Um, so you know, you're looking at probably one and a half to two percent more. And I think we've kind of lowballed our one in there. Um, and even the interest free period of five years would be pretty, pretty tough to get at the moment. Yeah. And um, I think seven, I've heard a few saying if, if you've got any issues, seven percent closer to what you know, that's what you right. Pay if there's any sort of lending issues, absolutely. And the other thing too is um, the negative gearing aspect. So it doesn't mm -hmm. exist inside of superannuation. You can negative well, gear in internally inside of the SMSF, but you can't use it against you know your other things. You can you can increase your levels of contribution. Mm -hmm. um, is probably the closest thing you'll get. Mm -hmm. um, but the key thing to remember is that you know the, those those so cheap cheap home loan rates and negative gearing has in the in the past probably you know created a really big impetus for, for someone to get into an investment property. Mm -hmm. You can't view property in SMSF with the same lens. Yeah, and, and your tax rate anyway is only 15%. So That's right. Yeah. And, and like I said, that's one part of it. The other part of it is um, if you're going to run it in the SMSF, you've got to run these yearly accounting and audit fees plus, your, um, plus if you're using a, a planner as well, mm -hmm. um, and quite possibly you might need uh, some sort of life insurance you mm -hmm. don't have. We, we didn't actually add that into this one. But for, for a lot of people, there is a requirement to go and get life insurance that they didn't otherwise have or have levels higher than what they, they already have. So yep. we, we sort of excluded that life insurance part, but that's often, you know, you could very easily see, say, four to $6,000 in extra costs mm -hmm. that this thing has to carry just to, just to manage the structure of being in a self-managed super fund, having a planner and um, potentially extra uh, life insurance. Absolutely. Okay, so that's our uh, assumptions. So I guess the, the, the key thing is the outcomes. So we've broken up the outcomes into a couple of time periods. So we've got a 10 year, um, and then we've got a, we're going to look at a 20 year one as well because there is the you know I guess the common um, argument is that property is a long term time frame, and we'd probably argue that 10 years if you're not doing something positive in 10 years or at least you know showing some benefit then is that is that a great investment? But yeah. also we'll, we'll we'll do 20 as well. Um, so we've used a couple of scenarios. So one is that we've just done a, a flat two percent value increase over um, over the periods. So um, on that basis, uh, the value of the SMSF net of it, you know um, obviously the the debts and everything. Else, so the, the raw value, or the final value, is uh, two hundred and thirty-six thousand eight hundred and twenty-four dollars. So, so that sounds pretty good, Tim. You know, we put in put in one hundred and fifty. We've got two hundred and thirty-six. That sounds like a, uh, a big win. It does until you um, factor in your contributions that you've been putting in over the last. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably looking at breaking. We we figured just about breaking even at the ten-year mark um, on the on your initial capital plus yeah. obviously your, yeah. your contributions so going in. Yeah. So we spoke about seven thousand dollars going in. Seven thousand dollars goes in for 10 years and, and increasing that you know without inflation and, and basically you've added an extra 80,000 so uh, worth of so you so your SMSF might be worth 236,000 but you've put in 150 you've added another 80 something thousand yourself so you've basically made you know a couple hundred, couple hundred bucks a year yep. yeah so not great um scenario two was was one we thought we'd just work into it as well and and couple of things for this so I'll just explain it so essentially what we've done is we've we've dropped the value of the property by 10% over mm -hmm. two years mm -hmm. and then we've worked on a higher um, you know growth rate the 3% growth rate over the, the remaining you know period so in this case eight years and we'll look at 20 yeah. in a minute and, and part of the reason for doing this was because um, the person in question we, we spoke about you know the, there was this real impetus to get into this property and we're going to save this for you and and um, we'll, we'll waive the stamp duties and we'll waive all these extra costs and we'll give this to you at a great price largely because from from my perspective, it looks like it's an overpriced. So mm. You're basically saying, "Well, we'll sell you a two hundred seventy thousand dollars property for three hundred thousand, but we'll we'll waive a whole bunch of things and make it feel as if you're getting a great deal because it's all on the sales bill." Yep, and but, uh, and there's also the issue of um, commission, which we'll touch on a little bit later as well. Mm. So once again, um, that, now this is when it's starting to, you know, in this scenario, be a, a, a really poor deal, and the yeah. fact that you're not even you're not even getting back any capital. Uh, well, you're not even, you know, you're not even, uh, yeah, you're not you're even losing money in the, the black <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after right. um, after that period. So we'll jump now to the the twenty year one. Once again, so scenario one, two percent over over twenty years. Um, so now the value of the the SMSF rises to four hundred near on four hundred and fifty thousand. So you know, based on on one fifty, we haven't got the the calc in there for the um, for the contributions. But um, I guess you know, if you if, if someone was to be presented, you know, uh, uh, this sort of scenario, they might go, well, I've got one hundred and fifty now. Yeah. You know, I don't understand that I'm going to be adding in, you know, one hundred sixty thousand dollars worth of. Uh, <laughs> 
have contributions or more. Mm. Um, so this looks like a, a pretty good deal. And, and likewise, now if you if you uh, work in that second scenario, so negative ten for the first two years, and then three percent for the remaining eighteen, um, the the figure jumps to four hundred and seventy one thousand. Yeah. And and both these, in terms of an actual return on your money that you're putting in, like an, an they call it an IRR calculation, which is basically saying, well. If I stick in ten thousand dollars in the last year, well, uh, you know, I only need to account for the fact for that for one year, and you know, and and, and whereas the one hundred and fifty thousand I've put in there for twenty years, and so what return do I get? Yep. An averaged out return, and and the average return under these are, are sort of one percent ish, one, between one and two percent on on both these scenarios. Wow. Yep. Okay. So there. So there you go. Yeah. Um, all right. So so that's um so that's I guess the the the. the the current scenario that's been put on the on the table, um, and we've got some uh, a stats, uh, a link to a stat, the uh, the workings and the calculations that I'll pass on at the end as well for those that are interested. Um, so we thought then we okay, well let's play that into the existing position. So the client before they accepted this advice in this case, um, what, how were they looking, and you know what was a what was the projection of that one? So we worked on a, a balance return of of seven percent. Um, with a 1% fee base, uh, which we think is pretty indicative of, of most funds. Uh, some can be 1.2, some can be 0.8. So um, 1% um, on average is, is not a bad figure to use. We, we kept that 7,000 a year super guarantee and we just rose it by inflation to, to apples with apples, um, the, uh, the previous example, the previous scenario. Yeah. So on that note, um, and just so you've got the figures there, um, so we had 10, 10 year of scenario one, we had the 10 year value of 236, uh, 236,000 and 20 year of 449. Um, and so if they had have remained uh, just doing nothing else <laughs> and not accepting this advice, uh, we've got a, a 10 year value of 376,000. Uh, which is a difference of 140 over uh, the, the recommended scenario, given those assumptions and um, and, the, and those uh, timeframes. 20 years, however, sees a jump now to 800 and nearly 18,000, or a difference of 368. Thousand uh, over over that period, so over 20 years, and in this case coincides reasonably well with retirement. Mm. I think in in the uh, for for the for these clients in question, so. Um, that's a figure not to be sneezed with. No, and it's worth noting, you know, that some of those, in terms of those figures, the, the big broad brush uh, uh, effect is within a within a typical Brisbane apartment, or well, a typical apartment with a 5% yield, growing at 3% per annum in terms of rent and all the costs involved in it, um, wound up into a typical SMS structure, um, you you wouldn't get your money back until 10 years, mm. like on just, one, just on what you put in. And then... You know that now you've got 10 years to actually try and make make up the the difference so you know if you want to invest in these things or and if you think there's any downside in property or, or any negativity in property then um you know you're losing bucket loads of money on this yep you've got to really really have a very very strong view on property and and that it's going to have historically high returns to make this um in, in, in any way attractive and, and just on top of that one thing that we um i guess and once again just providing the um the 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 bluest possible sky on on this earlier scenario was that we assumed full tenancy mm. for for twenty years, um, so not one missed payment and um, and all yeah. the rest of it. Plus, you know, kitchens or or you know, you've got to rip up carpet. I mean, we've got some some in there, but you know, there's there could, you could have big expenses that come up more frequently than what you expect, and that's yeah, that wipes out all your uh, all your profit as well. Yep. Spot on. So, look, if you if you wanted to check that out, I've um, I've basically just pumped the the big spread out as a PDF. And if you go to bit.ly forward slash nucleus n u c l e u s calc c a l c, um, you can you can grab that PDF off our um, off our website and check it out for yourself. Um, so, obviously, probably not the best advice, Damien. No. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> okay, so we'll jump into, um, I guess, some in, some in, uh, initial investigations, sort of post this, and this is where I, I find it interesting. Obviously, been in the industry for a long time, um, you, you sort of start to know where to look. The first thing I always do is follow the money, um, and for mine, um, you need to find out where 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 the money's going and and, and who's making money out of this, because typically that will then guide your opinion of you know of how this is all. You know, going to pan out. Um, the advice fee, uh, so we, so two two thousand dollars there for an advice fee, fairly indicative. Um, SMSF setup fee three and a half thousand, so that would go to the accountant. Um, once again, um, not not 
unknown. Look, for mine, I've seen them, you know, at two to five thousand to set up SMSF. So, um, but at the end of the day, there's there's money being made there. Um, an insurance commission, and, and we didn't work this into any of the figures, but of um, you know, typically around th- two and a half thousand as well. Uh, that commission would would generally go back to the advisor. Yep. That's, sorry, that's a life insurance commission. That's, sorry, yeah. that's life insurance commission. Yep. Mm. Um, a big one, of, of course, is is, and this is where I think a lot of the impetus for for property and SMSF comes from is is the property commission itself. Mm. So um, using that example, um, you know, our earlier scenario where um, potentially the, uh, the, the apartment was struggling to sell uh, and so they go to these, you know, effectively a secondary market in this case mm-hmm. to, to find new buyers um, that can be assisted into this process. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a 6.6% commission on this property, $20,000 we've, we've estimated, um, not disclosed, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, n- pretty fair. I've seen between, you know, five and 10% uh, percent commissions being offered by developers in particular, but, but also um, people that are trying to, to clear out stock uh, for anyone who can get rid of these. And of course, that just gets added onto the price. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's obviously, that's usually the person who's driving the whole the whole thing. So there's there's uh, accountants and, and financial planners and, and people like that who are, who are all, I guess, largely under today's compliance regime trying to do their little bit and disclaim away anything else as disclaim away as much as they can to say oh no i just did my you know no your honor i just did my tiny little piece of this you know i had no knowledge of anything else outside that yep um whereas the guy driving driving this is a guy who's going to get 20 grand if he can talk the person into the whole um yeah absolutely through the whole deal yep yep or you know perhaps there's a cut it's split up and you know the pie gets passed around as well. Mm. Uh, finally, mortgage commission as well, just estimated to be about 1100 bucks on, on that size mortgage. So but in total, um, this deal was, uh, you know, generated nearly $30,000 worth of uh, remuneration for, for parties that aren't the client, essentially. <laughs> Um, so, and, and you know, this 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 is um, absolutely why you know uh, th- there's a prevalence of this sort of stuff floating around. It's uh, it can be very lucrative for, for people that can get away with it. Um, moving on from that, I guess the you know f- for mine, then I go back and have a look at the um, the advisor, and in particular uh, the Australian Financial Service licensee that they operate under. Um, just broadly speaking, uh, this can be a really good indicator of the direction of the advice you're going to receive. Um, if you know, you know, if you know who's paying the piper, then you can pretty quickly figure out what the song is going to be. Um, and and so, that being said, there's nothing against big, you know, advisors working for big licensees. But um, the longer you stay in the industry, the more you know um, the nature of the advice and the style of products and all the rest of it that are going to come out of it. Um, because because that's essentially what they you know what they're paid to do. That's that's the you know that's the way it, the alignment works. Um, the key thing is the adequate disclosure of commissions. Um, it's it's legally required in a statement of advice that you know if if you accept this advice then people get paid what you know whether it be splits or, or um, and and this is particularly relevant in in the retail world which is in which you know most all, all statements of advice exist. But but it was worth noting that not all commissions need to be on this. Well, so we spoke about the mortgage commission and the yeah um, yeah and and uh, the commission on the property sale. And I mean, SMSF setups, I'm guessing, need to be in there, do they? Or yeah, well, the, the whole purpose of, and we'll jump into um, in a couple of slides. Well, this next slide is is around this best interest duty, and there's a couple of key parts. There's the big thing is, and admittedly, it could be a, a, essentially a, a grey area, right? If if you're recommending a certain part of it, and then and then it's going on to some other party, well, then if you don't know what their commission is, then you can't really disclose it. However, if if there's the outcome is that you you haven't adequately disclose what your arrangement and what you know is then you, you know, effectively you're going to be in a breach you know, it's going to it's not you're not going to be matching up to the best interest duty and we'll talk about it in a minute the the other key thing as well just for those who um, are looking to check in on um, on advisors just in general is there's a, uh, a fantastic tool on the moneysmart.gov.au website which is the ASIC um, you know uh, consumer finance website um, where there's an advisor register where you can actually get information um, of the advisor and then obviously the licensee sitting behind that and that's when you can start unpeeling the onion a little bit as mm. well yeah and so that was an example where 
you know, Tim's on this particular case, Tim's jumped in and, and there's sort of no AFSL information at all on, on the website or within any of the, the details and it actually required like quite a bit of digging behind the scenes to actually work out where did the license sit from, from a public perspective to make sure that... You know, Absolutely. That yeah. might, actually, once you know, you've ascertained the advisor's name, so in this case, and we won't, certainly won't name names, but it turns out that they were licensed to a, a, a major licensee um, and they're also a member of a uh, what I'd like to think is an upstanding, well, I'm a member of it, um, <laughs> uh, advice designation as well, which, um, yeah, they might want to know about uh, at some point. So the other thing too, I guess, for mine was just a quick... And this is just in addition to some red flags coming up, I guess, with the advisor, because... The, the licensee, the advice provided and, and, and then the licensee didn't quite match up in my mind. And I'm thinking, well, hang on, what's going on here? So then we went back and had a quick look at the um, the accountant, sort of referring accountant um, uh, website as well. And look, accountants aren't, I don't think anyway, um, required to have completely complied, you know, with it. But what I couldn't even find was an ABN on this accountant's website. It, it was, you know, there was about 20 people, um, you know, involved in, in it. There was certainly a mortgage broker involved. There was certainly some finance guys and all the rest of it. Um, and that's fine. Look, there are a lot of accountants out there that do a fantastic job and they are in all in one sort of service. However, um, I did a quick cursory check of the website and there's a, a service called Who Is where you can um, type in the website and it gives you a bit of information about the ownership of it. Um, eventually uncovered an ABN and then when I checked the ABN it was um, it was on an insolvency register so um, <laughs> now that might have just been a bit of tardiness in uh, moving from one uh, you know one ABN to another one but at the same time you know these are red flags that are coming up you know are we, are we dealing with a mob that um, are reliable and are going to be there in 20 years time when I when I follow this advice and I, I need to go back to them and or um, you know is this you know, starting to move into the realm of bucket shop so, so that's um, so. These are some some simple things. Um, look, as I said, look. If you've got a great advisor, they're going to be on the they're going to be on the Money Smart Advisor Register, and they're going to have a you know they're going to have an up to date um, history. You're going to be able to see exactly what's going on. They'll have nothing to hide. If they don't, I'd be getting a second opinion, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Just finally, um, so the the best interest duty. So I just thought I'd cover off in this. So this is actually um, a section of uh, so it's nine six one B. Uh, of the Corporations Act, um, and it, it's effectively a, um, a piece of legislation that all advisors or people that are providing advice uh, to to retail clients or personal advice to clients uh, must act in the in the best interests of that client. Um, and if, I've just sort of preceded it down into five points here. So, so what needs to be considered, and these are things that if you're sitting down in front of an advisor, I would sit down and I would make sure that each one of these areas has been ticked off. That's as, as simple as that. Um, and if it hasn't been ticked off in the advice document, then you need to find out why. So firstly, you need to have a look at the previous position if the client remains. Now that one was failed easily in our test. I think we showed, we, we've categorically shown that. Mm. Um, and you need to ensure that if you're moving from one product to another or accepting one direction and moving into another one, that, that at least you know, some, some effort's been put into your current position to make sure that if you just do nothing, <laughs> you can be better off. Um, the advice sought by the client. So if, the, if a client comes to, to an advisor and says, I need help on this, this and this, then those areas need to be covered off or they need to be explained why they can't be covered off and assisted to be found in some other, some other way, whether it be a referral or, um, or, you know, or just seeking to, you know, to find, find an answer to that. Um, the client objectives and financial situation and needs needs to be explained. So through, this is done generally through a fact-finding process, which is you know normally the first part of a meeting with an advisor, um, and you need to ensure that your objectives and financial situation has actually been correctly reflected back into this document because if that's the the snapshot that they've taken in order to build the advice, um, and then of course parlay that into your needs and you know what you're what you're going for, and that needs to be very clearly articulated in the advice document as well. I guess where you're getting to with this is that. Um, you know, if you turn up to a property salesman and he says, hey, I've got this mate who's a financial planner who'll, who'll do a bang-up job of, of slapping you into it and he'll sort it all out, is you want to make sure that he's not just rubber stamping this whole thing and saying, yeah, great, you know, I, I need to sell you a property so I can get a kickback from, you know, my, so my mate needs to sell you a property so, so I can get a kickback, so let me write up something quickly that, that approves everything. Um, that's, you know, legally he's not allowed to do that, mm. or he or she, they need to actually go through these steps and actually just make sure that, you know, why are you buying this property? Okay, I'm buying this property because I want to use it for my retirement. Okay, let's go through that. Okay, what what does your retirement mean? How long you got? You know, all those types of things that actually go into that whole... 100%. And, and, and at the same... Exactly right. And the, the point of it all is that... Um, 
most people uh, don't have a really firm idea of what 10 years away looks like or 15 or 20 years away looks like. So it's important that you you, you give some potentially some scenarios and this, this can cost a bit more. St statements of advice generally aren't cheap and the whole advice process isn't cheap, but the financial tools and calculators are pretty easy to say, okay, if you this is this is where we think we're going to go, and let's say it's property based for some reason, you know, the market is reflecting a two percent, you know, um, ongoing growth. What about if it's negative one over this amount of time, or something like that? Something that says, okay, well, if if it, everything doesn't go exactly to plan, then am I still going to be okay? You know, and that's really the outcome. You know, yeah. or do we need to change something initially yeah. to to wash that through? And, and and doubly so if you're using gearing. Just because, no, you know, the, the thing is, if I, if I invest in something, if I stick, you know, $150,000 into something and the prices go nowhere and I get a yield on it or, or the prices go backwards and I, and I get a dividend yield and I, I end up pretty square and all that type of stuff, I go, well, you know, I wasn't that happy with the investment, but, um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't lose all my money. Mm. Whereas if you've, once you've used, started using debt, now your interest payments are starting to eat in every year and and you've leveraged any return so a, you know a zero percent return on a on a property over 20 years or over 10 years say might not be catastrophic if you're um if it's all equity but if it's been used with all debt and all high price debt it might be catastrophic you might have zero left yep. you know by, by the end of it if you haven't got any return and you and you've had a few you know had to replace a bathroom or a kitchen or something like that you didn't expect um, yeah, you can literally go to zero yep. with, with some relatively simple assumptions if you have geared it too highly. So absolutely, and and that's um, particularly when you're using those sort of things where there is an opportunity to go to zero. Now that that's not to say you can't use that, but if the client is not aware that it can go to zero, then you're in hot water, and then almost certainly they're going to they're going to want to change that. Um, I think the the fourth and fifth one, um, well certainly the fourth one, which is costs of recommendations are understood uh, by the client. That one um, in this case I think was pretty unclear <laughs> it was look at the end of the day um that you know a, a client may wish to be for example in a, a a more expensive product or or they may um find that their needs are better met by something that's more expensive I mean, superannuation is a really good one there's a lot of really cheap super funds out there however if a client wants something that with more bells and whistles or something like that then if, as long as they understand that they're paying more but they're paying more to get what they actually want out of it then that in my eyes the best interest duty is met because they understood that, that you know well there's cheaper products out there you pay more to, to get more um whether or not i don't think that was met in this one um and then finally rolling into the final benefit is more than trivial so you're not effectively horse trading products to get them into your aligned product to mm. so just for a minimal benefit you know where, once again is it the best interest of you or is it in the best interest of the client to to, to go through the effort of making that and plus obviously the, the cost of um, making the change in the advice so essentially that just sort of sums up the the best interest duty and at the end of the day, that's a checklist, I think, just as, as a bare bones of receiving any advice that you should go through and you should say, okay, I, you know, this, this feels like it's been met or maybe there's a section here that, that needs to, you know, that in effect, it's your rights. Yeah. <laughs> you, these are your rights under the best interest duty and, you, you know, you need to make sure they're met as much as the advisor does. Yeah, and so, and so that final benefit, I guess what, what Tim's saying, just to put that in, in layman's terms, is that um, it's probably more, more of the case uh, when you're switching between funds uh, that your that your advisor has is it is if you're in a say an industry fund and then your um you, your advisor says oh look i can get you out of that fund and into this other fund which is very similar but you know roughly the same fees and all that type of stuff and i can do all these changes for you and in the, the net effect is very little for you but the advisor now grabs your business and has a commission trailing commission and things like that mm -hmm. then that's that's where that part needs to come in is, is sort of going well um and, and from my part you know if, if you're looking at these things and saying well, well why am i changing from a balanced fund over here to a balanced fund over there when the performance is similar or the you know the the the, the ongoing yeah. forward look, there's not too much to, to, to judge between them. Absolutely. All right, very good. So I guess um, with all that thought about, um, the key thing here, I guess, that we're just going to finish up on is the importance of, of a second opinion. Um, and it's really, what, what would you prefer? The, the time spent and perhaps some small cost in getting someone else to look at it over the cost of poor advice and in this you know in our in our worked example it would run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars over many years that you're not going to get back you're just not going to get that back um is it worthwhile if you do if you are under an advice situation or you you, you know you're seeking advice or you've, you've been given advice um that you're not not 100 sure of maybe the numbers aren't stacking up maybe the projections aren't there maybe the questions aren't being answered correctly um is it worthwhile 
uh, coming, you know, checking out somebody to, to get a second opinion. And, and indeed, who, who do you go to <laughs> as well? Um, in, in my eyes, it is. I think, you know, as we mentioned before, the example with a doctor, if you're going in for a sniffle or to get something done, you know, something small that you can just get, you know, the, the downside is not terribly horrible, then I think everyone's pretty right to walk away with that. I think financial advice is a completely different part of the world, though. This is going into a GP, you know, with um, some big growth on the side of your body, and they go, oh, no, 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 a bit of Panadol, and that'll look after it. Like, the, the damage that can be done from poor advice almost almost necessitates the need for a, a second opinion, and much the way you, you, you go through it in a, in a medical sort of side of things if you weren't happy with it. Um, for us, we're, we've uh, been working with the Independent Financial Advisors Association of, of Australia, uh, soon to be the profession of independent financial advisors, so they are getting their professional designation. Um, one of the things we liked about the, these guys is, uh, so they're a national network of advisors that um, are part of this association, um, all independent. And let me just preface this, there's no fees, this isn't a paid <laughs> no, this is not. This is just an example of a group. We're, we're, what we I think probably Tim should have started that by saying what what we've generally looked for as soon as you start worrying about bad advice is rather than going to somebody else who who is also selling one of their own products and will try and talk you out of using somebody else's product into into their own product. What we're saying is if you can get an independent person who doesn't take product fees, doesn't take any any commissions or anything like that, then you can rely on them better to give you a, a, an independent view about it. And this yep. is just one one group that does it. Absolutely. An uh, yeah, and this is an example. There are other guys out there. These are just the ones that we've um, been talking to recently and, and as, a, as a natural on flow from us. And look, mm. you know, obviously we're, we work in the advice space. Mm. So um, for us, we have never recommended our product over any other product. Um, and so we provide information and we make we help people make it make a decision to invest mm. with us mm. if they need a comparison then for us that's conflicted and mm. so we need to find a you know a national network that that yeah. meets the touch that meets the standing and um for us the, the well the ieaa is one one example they've got a gold standard of independence which uh has uh, to be a member of that and to get that seal they have no ownership links uh, or affiliations and they don't accept commissions or incentive payments from products um or us, of course, mm. uh, and no asset-based fees as well. Then you know you're getting something. You know, if if a person can say hand on heart and legally that they're independent, then you know that there's no conflict for them to move you into something else that's potentially going to uh, once again be in their best interests. Mm. Very good. So on that note, we'll hear some more about Nucleus Wealth. Nucleus Wealth and the Macro Business Fund was put together to help give you access to quality, well-researched stock analysis and superior macroeconomically-minded asset allocation. We use technology to help us provide a service typically only available to high net worth and sophisticated investors at a fee level that rivals the more basic solutions available to everyday investors. We do this by using separately managed accounts, which allows clients to enjoy unparalleled transparency of what they own and why. It also means that each client effectively owns their own separate and discrete share portfolio managed daily by us. We have partnered with Linear Asset Management, who are backed by the ANZ Bank for Cash Management and JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, as custodian of your assets. In our new personal superannuation option, we have partnered with Premium, who is backed by HSBC as custodian and ANZ for cash management. We feel these structures are the gold standard for your financial protection. In addition to this, we offer 19 separate and individual ethical screens that you can use to help tailor your investment to ensure that your money is not being used to support companies that deal in areas and practices that you feel are important. By eliminating only the areas that are important to you, you avoid missing out on the potentially higher returning areas that you are ambivalent about, which are often ruled out in other broader ethical investment options currently available in the market. The name Nucleus comes from our ability to provide the core holdings of a client's portfolio, allowing them the time to explore areas that may be of interest or they have experience in. We also offer a complete investment solution for those who don't have the time to coordinate their own investments. Our investment team has decades of experience in world markets, and we have access to a global team of stock analysts. By removing the layers of middlemen that sit between your money and the markets, we've been able to reduce fees and provide unparalleled transparency in the solution we provide. 
For more information on what we can do for you, please call 1300 623 863 or contact us through www.nucleuswealth.com. And uh, just to let you know that our personal superannuation option is up and running, so now uh, you can invest with us using your super, uh, if, you, if you wish. Uh, you can jump online to portal.nucleuswealth.com, check it all out. Uh, we've got our onboarding site there, shouldn't take more than about 10 minutes if you've got your wallet and super information with you. You can select your ethics, we've got 19 different ethical screens as I mentioned before. Uh, you can compare fees with all the well, 40 of the major uh, super funds, we've got a fee range of um, cheapest to most expensive in there for, for about 40 odd of the biggest ones in Australia uh, and you can also seek advice both limited advice uh, through us for the most appropriate mix of, of portfolios and also of course seeking further advice uh, through the IFAA. Coming up next week same bat time same bat channel Thursday the 6th of December 12 30 p.m we have a special guest we've got hedge fund manager Eric Townsend so for those who, who, who don't know Eric Townsend is a retired software entrepreneur turned hedge fund manager uh, he's the co-host of a very popular finance podcast called macro voices feel free to check that one out and of course he's just written a, a new book called beyond the blockchain the death of the dollar and the rise of digital currency really looking forward to chatting in, with him through the week um, and then we're going to be bringing that one out as pre-recorded we're going to send out an email as well uh, for anybody who would like to uh, send in some questions of Eric uh, when we get him on the line on uh, Tuesday morning uh, from the US so really looking forward to that one it's going to be all things cryptocurrency uh, the US dollar hegemony uh, what else have we got we've got yeah it's going, to, it's going to be a pretty fantastic one he's a very knowledgeable guy uh, and as always, uh, we are available on uh, iTunes Podcast Addict and now Spotify, which is fantastic. We've been loaded up on Spotify. Uh, feel free to uh, like our, our channel or download the uh, download our episodes. Uh, you can head over to bit.ly Nucleus Insights for, for more information. Please give us a like, five stars, write a, rev a review if you uh, like what you hear. And of course, that just gets us up the rankings and uh, gets our message out there. So uh, please uh, get over to, uh, to checking that out. And just finally, thanks very much for attending uh, you can as always fill out our survey bit.ly forward slash nuclear survey all one word uh, it gives us a little bit of feedback on how we've gone today and of course you can drop in any topics you'd like to hear more about going for, uh, going forward also special guests actually if you've got a few ideas for special guests um, we're always uh, happy to hear it as well so on that note look thanks very much for attending I hope you got something out of it uh, I certainly uh, had a bit of fun putting this one together for a change rather than just being the guy in the middle uh, and uh, we'll look forward to catching you at the next one. Cheers.